living in Colorado, we just have to step outside, open up the windows to see the beauty of nature as God has created it. A beauty that fills our souls, leads us to gratitude and worship. But in the last couple of weeks, if you've opened up your television or gone online, you've seen how nature can also be destructive and devastating and wipe out homes. I'm sure like many of you, I, I know many people who were in the storms past going through Florida and the East Coast. I contacted a pastor or two that I know where I'd been at and just said, we're praying for you. And I know many of you are praying for them as well. It reminded me of when Lisa and I first moved to Houston, Texas in, in July, 2010. Just about six to eight weeks later, we started seeing these signs and they're all over the highway system in Texas that time of year, just the end of August, early September. Hurricane season is here. Be prepared. And it sounded terrible to us. I mean, we, we came from the Pacific Northwest where weather wasn't really an issue besides rain. If you had an umbrella and a coat, you were okay. And they all talk about how the West Coast should expect the big earthquake and Mount Rainier is actually potential, has the potential to get active, but, but nothing year to year like we saw with hurricane season out in Texas. So we took it really serious the first couple of years. You've got water, you've got everything, the kits that you need. But when the hurricane doesn't come the first year or the third year or the fifth year or the sixth year, you start thinking, ah, we, we, we've heard it before. So when there were rumblings in 2017 that Hurricane Harvey was gonna be a big one, I, I have to admit, yeah, we, we've kind of heard it before. And so then when it hit, it was devastating around Galveston, but not that big a deal around Houston. I thought, well, there we go. But then it moved over Houston and camped out and dropped biblical levels of rain over 50 inches in just three days. It was unbelievable. I'd never seen anything like it. That night, we'd invited two friends over. I'm not usually a pay-per-view guy, but there was a scheduled bout between an MMA guy that was gonna actually box a boxer. I wanted to see how that worked, and so I invited a good friend over and his wife. And as the weather got louder and noisier, the wife kept saying, oh, I hope Belle is okay. I hope Belle is okay. Belle is there at the time, 17-year-old dog. And dog is a little bit of a generous description. If you've been here, you all know I love dogs. I think dogs are amazing. I don't think people deserve dogs. But the reality is this dog had been past its sell-by date for some years. It's just this tiny little toy poodle that it, it sort of resembled a dish rag. You know, the kind that get dry out and you, you put up there. I mean, maybe it was a pound and it was literally deaf and blind. You, you couldn't call it. You couldn't wave to it. You just had to pick it up and put it on the grass. And she figured out what she was supposed to do. And the whole time as the weather got worse and worse, Tab kept saying, boy, I hope Belle is okay. I hope she's not scared. And her husband, Rob, said, honey, she's deaf and blind. She doesn't know there's a storm. But Tab knew there was a storm and she just couldn't let it go until finally Rob said, well, do you want me to go get her? Well, if you think we should, he goes, well, I don't, but I think you do, so I'm gonna go ahead and do it. Good little marriage lesson there, guys. Sometimes we just do what's best for our wives. And so he went and Belle was so traumatized by this storm that she was fast asleep when he got there. So he <laughs> woke her up. And that's when we knew how bad this storm might get because Rob had the right kind of car, normally about five minutes from our house. It took him almost 45 minutes to get to us. Roads were already flooding. He had to find new ways to get there. And later that night, as the rains kept coming down, it's not unlike anything we'd ever seen. The, the ditches started to fill up with water. Our car tires started to be covered in water, at least the, the bottom half. And now it's inching up toward our house. Now, we lived in a place of Houston called The Heights, which Lisa and I used to laugh at because it got the title The Heights because it's 28 feet above downtown. We're just two miles from downtown, it's 28 feet. Only in flat Houston could 28 feet be considered The Heights. I mean, I'm saying this in, in, in the Denver area. But we stopped laughing that night because in the face of those floods, you'll take every inch your house will get you. 
But as the water's creeping up toward our house, I think, okay, I should have taken this seriously. I got online, this is so pathetic. Okay, what do you do to protect your house in the case of flooding? And I had all of these suggestions. So I looked in the garage and I had nothing to do anything. All I could find was some cardboard and blue painter's tape which in the face of water is completely worthless. It was so ridiculous. But by God's grace, the water never got up into our house. But it was a good reminder to me that just because the storm didn't hit the first year or the third year or the fifth year, it doesn't mean it's not going to come. In fact, if you live in certain parts of this country, the question isn't if the storm will hit. The question is when the storm will hit. And will you be ready? And it is so easy to just be lulled to sleep when the storm never comes. And it's not just true of climate, it's true of the state of our relationships and our marriages in particular. We see people going down in storms all the time. It might be a financial storm, but that's never gonna happen to us. We've, we've handled our money. Or a medical storm. Well, we're a pretty healthy family. Or betrayal. Well, that, that's just not us. I've talked to so many couples. They can't imagine they would ever smell that storm until it threatens to blow down their house. So today, as we wrap up this series on relationships, we wanna look at how will your marriage stand in the face of a storm that has wiped out so many other homes. Now singles, I want you to hear as well because this is so key. When you think about marrying someone, if you want to get married or choose to get married, this is something I find that singles rarely consider. It's all about do we have fun on dates? Do we get along? Are, are, are things good? It, it's one thing to be fair weather friends, but are you considering marrying someone who has the character and the spiritual maturity to go through a storm with you because storms are inevitable. And frankly, whether or not you're married, everything I'm about to say here is as relevant for singles as it is for married people because whether you're married or single, you will go through storms. And Jesus wants to prepare us for that. And I think in some of his kindest words, he mentions this in Matthew 7 so we can get ready. He says this, therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, there's, there's something about Jesus has spoken something. Jesus says, if you've heard these words and then you make them a part of your life, that's like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall. Because it had its foundation on the rocks. Jesus said, the storm came, this house stood. Now, what's the next thing? But everyone who hears these words of mine, they don't put them into practice. They're like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. The, the rain came down, the streams rose, the winds blew and beat against that house. And it fell with a great crash. Now, here's the danger we have to be aware of. The storms will hit your house. You don't know what direction the storms are gonna come. You don't even know what kind of storms they'll be. But one of two things will be true when a storm hits your house. Your marriage will be a fortress against the storm. And, and the enemy can send the worst winds and rain and anything you could imagine. And it'll be like this fortress and you'll stay inside and you'll grow stronger. Or... Your marriage will collapse with the storm. And when that happens, your marriage will become the biggest problem. Bigger than whatever storm lashed out against your house. Now, the crumbling of your marriage will be the biggest problem. So how can we be like those that Jesus says, puts his words into practice so that when the storms do hit, we can stand. I want to mention three things in particular we can do to make our marriage a fortress, or if you're single, frankly, just to make your life a fortress in the face of the storms. The first thing we have to do is just to get stronger individually by pursuing godliness. First Timothy 4.8 says, godliness has value for all things. So we don't often think of godliness as that important. We, we don't think we need it to go to heaven. I mean, we go to heaven because of Jesus' work on the cross. So we don't often grow. We let compromises remain in our life. These compromises make us weaker, but we don't value godliness like Paul does. He says you have godliness as value for all things. There isn't any arena in your life. There isn't any 
storm you might face in your life where godliness won't serve you well. Uh, back in earlier days, not that long ago, I was running one or two marathons a year. And when I was in a phase when I was trying to qualify for Boston, I had to get in really good shape. And I, I love doing that. I love the feeling of being in shape. And I'll never forget one weekend I was coming in. I had just spoken at an event. And then I was meeting up with Lisa in Houston. She hadn't been with me. And then we're going to travel on to go on a vacation. Now, many of you have gotten to know my wife. Very gentle and sweet. But when it comes to protecting her vacations, she can get fierce. Vacations matter to her, all right? It's not that they're scheduled by the hour. They're kind of scheduled by the minute. You know, these three things we can do before breakfast or this or that. I know how much they matter to her. She loves vacations. And the problem is my flight coming into Houston was getting delayed longer and longer. And it looked like we might miss our flight and maybe not even fly out till the next day. When my flight finally landed... And I had about two minutes to make it to the gate. So Lisa's with the gate attendant saying, look, my husband's flight has landed. He just texted me and he goes, yes, ma'am, but he's on the other side of the airport. He'll never make it here before we have to close the gates to, to finish boarding. And Lisa looked at him with this ferocity, practically grabbing his clothes. My husband runs marathons. He'll be here. And he didn't believe her, so he calls up another couple. He said, look, I'm giving him, he's got an hour, or he's got a minute and 45 seconds. Um, when he's not here, I'm gonna shoot you guys through. I just wanna have you ready so you can go right in. So she's standing. Lisa turns up, don't bother. My husband runs marathon. He's going to be here. And she texted me. I knew what my job was, and I took off. And at that point in my life, it, you know, I, I didn't get that tired. I could run pretty hard, even carrying a bag. And I kept going. And 15 seconds to spare, I turned the corner. And this couple, you could see their frustration. They just could taste getting on the flight. They had to sit down. Lisa's jumping up and down. This is so exciting. She goes, it's just like the amazing race, which happens to be uh, one of our favorite television shows. But here's the thing. I, I didn't get in physical shape. Because I thought, you know, there's going to be a time when I need to run across the entire Bush Airport in Houston so that my wife can get to vacation on time. But being in shape physically meant whatever the challenge was, I could do it. Paul would say the same thing is true for godliness. You don't know how you're going to be tested, how your life is going to be tested, how your family's going to need you. But when you grow in godliness, and don't just take it for granted, you'll be strong when you need to be strong. Otherwise, you might be weakest just when your family needs you to be strongest. I think of Doug. He had harbored a sexual addiction for years. He was off the charts organizationally. He could keep things going. He could fool his wife. He could succeed in his vocation. He could put in his time at church even, and everything was okay until the day came when he was exposed. He couldn't lie anymore. Doug said he thought that was the worst day of his life. Looking back, he now says he thinks it was one of the best days of his life because it caused him to get serious about getting right with the Lord. And he, he did everything. He went work, started working with a licensed clinical counselor he got into a 12-step group and met the standard, the model, 30 meetings in 30 days. He was listening to the podcast, reading the books, making calls to sponsors, earnestly giving himself over to it. Even went into clinical polygraph tests four times a year. His wife could ask him anything with a licensed polygraph operator, and he knew he could no longer lie. And I share this to tell wise, I want you to understand this, that when a husband gets caught, it could be a wife as well, but when a husband gets caught, repentance isn't just tears. I've seen guys cry because they're ashamed, they're embarrassed, they don't wanna lose their families, but feeling sorry isn't repentance. Repentance involves actions going in the opposite direction, and that's what Doug did. He got involved with the groups. He did the positive growth. He pursued godliness with a passion. 
And he began to be transformed. And after a time of separation, that level of betrayal almost always requires a separation. They're able to put their lives back together. 18 months after Doug entered recovery, their daughter was diagnosed with a very serious form of cancer. We'll never forget the day the doctor sat Doug and Rochelle down and said, well, she's likely going to lose her leg, but with aggressive treatment, we're hoping that we can keep her alive. They couldn't imagine that. So now Rochelle is spending long days and most nights at the hospital. Doug is home with their two boys trying to take care of them. And Doug and Rochelle both told me, if Doug had not been in recovery, our marriage wouldn't have survived. Rochelle said, even though his organization skills were off the chart, this would have buried him because there's a whole new level of involvement. And Doug confessed to me, he goes, Gary, if I wasn't in recovery, I would have started acting out like crazy. It's how I dealt with uncertainty. It's how I dealt with fear. It's how I dealt with shame. He goes, I can't even imagine that I wouldn't have been there for my two boys when we were home alone at night. And they needed me to be focused on them, not trying to get away from them, to act out. My wife needed to know she could trust me. She's at the hospital. She needed to know I would be there. I would do what I said I would do. He goes, and the thought that I wouldn't have been there for my daughter, just when she needed me the most. And they both said they saw so many couples because often things like this will tear apart marriages. And how awkward it was that the wife and the husband couldn't be at the hospital at the same time. They said, we're so glad that our daughter never had to face that. Doug's pursuit of godliness in the face of devastating sin allowed him to be strong just when he needed to be strong. He didn't pursue godliness because he thought his daughter would get cancer. He had no idea. But having let go of the sin that so easily entangled him, now he was able to be there for his wife, for his daughter, for his two boys. And by God's mercy, not only was their daughter kept alive, she was able to keep her leg. And it was amazing testimony of God's grace and faithfulness. Or I think of Joe and Janelle. They had, had trouble conceiving children. They had one that they loved very much, a boy named Garrett. He was a good guy, loved the Lord, was great with kids. Uh, just all around, they just had such great hope in his future. They were so proud of him. But like a lot of us do adults, you know, that our age, if you've got college age kids, sometimes you just start coasting in life and you're Christians and you're involved in church, but you just let things sort of make you weak. You're, you're sort of absorbing spiritual junk food. You're not really serious about scripture, even church participation. You're just kind of going through the motions and eventually it began to show itself in Joe's life and in Janelle's life. They realized they were drifting apart as a couple. And so just before Garrett had gone off to college, they got serious. Joe had to go into counseling himself to deal with these issues, to get strong again. And then Janelle went into counseling. Then they went into couples counseling and entered sort of a honeymoon phase, even though they'd been married over 25 years at the time. When Garrett went to college at a and in College Station, it was in the fall, late fall, and Janelle went out for a mother-son weekend that they had there. She had to return Saturday night. A lot of the moms stayed over because she was singing in the choir on Sunday morning. And as she dropped Garrett off, he came around the car, rolled down the window and kissed her on the cheek, which is unusual for Garrett. He wasn't really physically affectionate like that. And they said, I love you, mom. And he took off toward the dorms. It was the last act of Garrett with his mom, was kissing her on the cheek. The last words he ever said to her were, I love you, mom, as he left. Janelle woke up early the next morning, getting ready for church, having her coffee. And there was a knock on the door. She could see through the glass door, there was a police officer there. And she just knew something inside her told her Garrett was gone. She opens up the door and there's this young police officer and 
He was very uncomfortable. And that's why I love as we celebrate police enforcement and the officers, what they do today. We have no idea the kind of situations they face. How do you tell two parents, not just your son, is that your only child is gone? And he just said, ma'am, is your husband here? She said, yes. I suggest you go get him so I can tell you together. She ran upstairs, threw on a robe, brought Joe down and heard the awful news about a terrible accident. They would never see their son alive again. And as the future went before Janelle's eyes, she realized, I'm never going to be a mother-in-law. I'm never going to be a grandmother. Every mother's day, there's going to be, I mean, the loss was incalculable. And Janelle admitted, man, I, I started to fall apart. She was strong in the Lord, but she just needed to lean on Joe. She said, Gary, for that first year, it was 95% Joe and 5% me keeping our marriage together. I was so trying to just deal with my grief and my loss. It was hard for me to be there in my marriage. And the second year it flipped. Joe now started to realize he had to be strong for Janelle, but it's like now as she's getting stronger, he could be weaker. And then he had this awful court case. He was a plaintiff lawyer and he was working with just some very disreputable Awful people, frankly. They made a truckload of money, but he says, I don't think it was worth it. It almost buried me. It almost buried our marriage. And Janelle said, yeah, that second year, it was 75% me and 25% Joe. I think Janelle was being kind to Joe. I think it's probably 95% Janelle and 5% her or, or Joe but at that time, but she was just trying to be fair. And, and here's why it's so key if you're single, choosing wisely who you marry, if you're so much spiritually mature than someone, or if you're already married and just coasting on your spouse's spiritual strength, when the storm hits, you'll respond to those storms differently. The hits will affect you differently. You both need to be strong. A strong marriage requires two strong individuals because the whole point of a marriage is that different times you can lift each other up. Husbands, you can't survive. Your marriage can't survive on your wife's faith alone. Wives, your marriage can't survive on your husband's strength and spiritual insight alone. The day will come when you need each other. And again, Joe and Janelle didn't get into spiritual shape. They didn't start pursuing godliness because they thought, well, we might lose our son someday. You don't anticipate the worst nightmare imaginable. But because it had that sweet eight month season of getting right with, no, we need to get reconnected as a marriage. We need to remember this is what it means to be believers. This is how we grow in godliness. That's what they did. And so the storm didn't bury them. It actually helped them grow closer together. Hebrews tells us, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. Notice it says everything that hinders and the sin that entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. It doesn't have to be a sexual addiction. It could be a substance abuse that you're getting involved in. It doesn't have to be scandalous. It could be excessive gaming. Maybe you're using food as comfort instead of nourishment. But if there are spiritual components in your life, you know they're making you weak. They're entangling you. You're not free to run the race that God has given you. You're not in shape spiritually. You can get by when the weather is good and everything seems to be fine. But Jesus' words would warn, the storm is coming. Will the godliness you're pursuing now be strong enough to get you through those storms? Or will you crush? So part of godliness is just getting rid of what makes you weak. There's two other components of godliness, though, about how to become strong. That second point, then, is this. Getting strong in God's word. Hebrews 4.12 says, the word of God is living and active. Look, the older I get, the more in love I fall with God's word. It is a miracle. 
We often treat it as this obligation, this duty. Yeah, I got to read my Bible or whatnot. I can't tell you how many times in life I feel laid out and eight words or two verses or a paragraph from Psalms or Ephesians or Colossians or Romans will just lift me up and change my day. I I don't know how I can be a bigger proponent or a bigger fan of the power of God's word. It's not just words. God reveals himself and we need it because when the storms hit, it's God's word that will sustain us. I go back to Joe and Janelle. Janelle shared how Throughout their life, they've been involved in Bible studies, sometimes participants, sometimes teaching. She said, Gary, these were serious Bible studies. I mean, we really got into it. But as they're telling me their story of losing their only child just, just before his 20th birthday, and she could see how I was feeling overwhelmed by grief for them. Then I saw a strength enter her. The strength she drew from God's word, she quoted for me 2 Corinthians 5, 8. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And some of her nights, pushing back against despair, this verse lifted her up. It's one of the most astonishing statements of faith I've ever heard somebody tell me. She goes, Gary, God didn't just call Garrett from us. He called Garrett to something. To be absent from the body is present with the Lord. That means today, right now, as we speak, my Garrett is perfectly serving God in his glorified state. Whatever God created him to do, that's what Garrett is doing. Perfectly, without failure, without sin, he's living in his glorified state. And that gives me so much joy. She says, I, I wish he was still here, but I, I talk to my friends and they tell me about daughter-in-law issues or kids that are going off the rails or losing their faith or getting depressed or getting addicted. She goes, I don't have that. I know whatever Garrett is doing every day, he's perfectly serving the Lord. I don't have to pray, Lord, keep him from this, protect him from that. I just get to anticipate seeing him in that state. I can't wait to see the way that God is using him right now. And if you could see her face, this wasn't just head knowledge to her. This was giving her strength. It was nurturing. It was building her up. It gave her hope. And if I could even say it, joy in the face of the worst loss and pain imaginable, she was claiming joy from God's word. I think of Emma and Billy, their storm was financial. Billy had made millions of dollars, very successful living in Southern California. And then a number of things happened. The housing market collapsed in 2008. Other things happened, regulations and COVID pretty much wiped them out. And they had given away so much money. I mean, hundreds of thousands. They had supported missionaries. And by support, I don't mean 50 bucks a month. I mean, they supported them. And when the missionaries' kids went to college, they paid the tuition. That's how aggressive they were as givers. And now, entering retirement, they can pay their day-to-day bills, and that's it. They have nothing to look forward to as far as financially. And they're shocked because when you go from millions to just living month to month, it's devastating. And I've seen this trap so many couples. Your your, your financial insecurity becomes marital insecurity. How could you let this happen? Or why did we spend that? Why didn't we save more? It's filled with accusations when a marriage goes through this. And yet I was talking to a couple that was strengthened. They love each other as intensely as I've seen a couple love each other. I said, what happened? How'd you get here? And that's when Emma told me of a morning, she was reading Psalm 23. You've all heard this verse, verse one. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall lack nothing. So Gary, I realized I won't lack, not because my husband is a brilliant businessman or things are gonna change or the economy is gonna turn around or California politicians aren't gonna act like California politicians. Good luck with that. Her, Her hope was not in the economy or the government or even her husband's ability to overcome all of that or her ability to overcome all that. She said, we won't lack because the Lord is our shepherd. 
One sentence helped turn them toward each other and find strength and hope to keep going. That's how powerful God's word is. So we should be like bears looking forward to hibernation, ravenously gathering all the riches of God's word that he gives us. He's so kind to, in, in the Psalms and the Proverbs and the gospels, the epistles. It's amazing how many riches God gives to us through his word. We should just be consuming it and storing it up because the day will come when our life depends on it. Our spiritual sustenance and sanity depends on it. It's so easy to look at Bible study as this, well, I'll open up the Bible once or twice a week, but it's almost just so God will just leave us alone. We don't understand the power of God's word, but when the storms hit, you're gonna to wanna to have it stored up so you can pull it out. And then the third thing that we have to do to become strong is to grow our community. Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Now he's talking about a different day there, but it's just as relevant. The day of the storm is coming when we will need each other. It's often we don't feel like we need each other. Like Bible study, church seems like this obligation. Well, if I hit 50%, I'm doing better than most people as far as attendance and, and, and then maybe God will just leave me alone. But when the storms hit, you're gonna recognize how crucial it is to have your community in place. I go back to Joe and Janelle. That terrible morning, Sunday morning, she only had to make one call, just one call. And almost within minutes, the block was covered with cars. Their house was filled with believers there to walk through this with them, to encourage them, to lift them up. Janelle told me she pulled one of her best friends aside and said, look, I've seen the statistics. 70% of marriages won't survive this. I've already lost my son. Please don't let me lose my marriage. You gotta walk through us, through this with us. You gotta help us stay together. And then Joe, I mentioned he had a tougher time the second year. They had the worst fight of their life, of their marriage, 18 months after Garrett was gone. And he storms out and Janelle's terrified. So she calls one of their closest friends from the church who also, again, thank you law enforcement, had connections with the police department. You all gotta go get him. I don't know what he's gonna do. I don't know what's gonna happen. He just needs you. And they were there. Now, if they had waited until the crisis hits to get serious about community, it would have been too late. You can't call on people like that when you don't know them, but because they'd been involved in Bible studies and small groups and choir and attending the church, just when they needed a community to surround them, the community was there. I'll go back to Doug, whose daughter was diagnosed with cancer. He told me when he was working with guys in the recovery group, he said, Gary, I knew all about their inner hearts. I knew their character strengths and weaknesses. I knew their sins. I knew the last time they had sinned. I knew how they related to their wife. I knew the harm that they had done and what they were trying to do. He goes, I didn't know their jobs. I didn't know their favorite sports teams. I didn't know what neighborhood they lived in or how much they made. He goes, half the time, I don't know their last name. Then I go to church. He says, it's the opposite. I know what neighborhood they live in. I can guess how much they make. I know their job. I know their favorite sports team. I don't know anything about their real life, their inner life, how they are with the Lord, how they're doing battle with sin. It's one of the great challenges for me as a pastor. I don't know how to get over this. How can we build that sense of community without having to go through addiction? Because it's people in recovery I see that take community seriously because they know isolation is the threshold to falling again. And so many of us, we have to let our lives get messed up. We live these isolated lives and we get by for a while when everything's good. We don't think we need community. You talk to people in recovery, they depend on community. But the secret is all of us do. We just get by for a while without it. 
So how do we get more serious? How do we focus on it? Regen is a great ministry here at this church. It's not just one particular type of recovery. It deals with so many issues. But how, how can the entire church value relationships and community? It's a great place to start if you're looking at it. But can we be more intentional? I know that's Kurt's vision for this church. How do we become a church known for its relationships so that you belong? And, and I prepare so much for these sermons and whatnot, but just afterwards, I knew a guy who had had some, some medical challenges personally and then an issue with one of his family members and was able to pray for him and see him visibly moved emotionally. Every week, we've got to be here for each other. God doesn't want us to live alone. Relationships are key to what he's doing. When Lisa and I moved to Houston from the Northwest, we found that Houston has two seasons, very hot and warm. <laughs> and then we moved here to Colorado this summer. And about the end of August, maybe the first week in September, we were walking around Wash Park and it just, it felt different. It smelled different. It looked different. We were like, what, what is this? And then all of a sudden it hit us. It's fall. <laughs> Colorado has a fall and we love fall. We just gotten used to living with that. This is so cool. Colorado has four seasons. I don't know what season your marriage in, but let me ask what season is your marriage in? Here's what I can tell you for certain. It won't always be spring or summer. There will be a time when you will be tested like you've never been tested before. And if the temperature is okay and calm, you can get by with that little addiction on the side. Maybe nobody knows yet. It's making you weaker, but it's not burying you. You can be lackadaisical about God's word. You're okay. You're not gonna lose your salvation. And church is just sort of, well, it's something we should be doing, but we don't wanna get too serious about it. But what will you do when the storms really hit? Paul warns Timothy, Watch your life and doctrine closely. Persevere, because if you do, you'll save both yourself and your hearers. And then Jesus says many times throughout the gospels, I just mentioned three times here, but he says, watch out. I've got three, there's many other words Jesus use. Be careful, be on your guard. Just go through the Bible. Look at all the times Jesus is saying, be careful. These aren't threats. They're words of love where Paul and Jesus understand this isn't a kind world to our marriages. It's not a kind world to singles. It's times when we will face storms where they're unexpected just because we didn't have one last year. They're coming and say, so, so don't be caught off guard. Put your house in order. Grow in godliness. Don't sustain anything that's making you weak spiritually. Overindulging in mindless medium. Any number of things can go on. Get serious about God's word. Be like that bear going into hibernation. And grow community, be intentional. How do we get to know some people? Kurt talked last week about the certain circle. How do we build our smallest circle? And then the circle after that, and then the circle after that. Because if we're strong in godliness, strong in God's word, and we have our community, it doesn't matter what direction the storm comes in. It doesn't matter what kind of storm. We'll be together, we'll be closer, we'll be stronger because our marriage is a fortress that doesn't crumble, but helps us be strong. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your kindness that this might be your loving words of warning for those where we've just gotten soft in some areas of our life and we've gotten away with it but you see the future and you might be saying to a few here, it is time to deal with this. And none of us have to deal with it alone. I thank you for this church, for the leadership, the members, the elders, the staff members, God, all of whom are walking together. May we be people who will hold each other up that when the storms hit, we can go arm in arm into the fiercest battles and come out victors. 
Thank you, Lord, for the truth of your word. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.